you call it the 40 year war, which is a great title because you're not just talking about the US invasion in uh, 2002. You also write about uh, how the United States uh, was very much involved in building up the Taliban uh, in order to fight off uh, the Soviets who had taken control of Afghanistan. Can you um, elaborate on that history a little bit? Um, it's a long history, as, as, as you know. Uh, but basically, uh, during the Cold War, the Iranian regime, which was then run by the king, the Shah of Iran, under U.S. advice and pressure, wanted to get rid of the left, which was getting strong in Afghanistan and was quite dominant in the army and the air force. And in order to prevent uh, the president of the country, who was heavily under the Shah's pressure, the, there was a coup d'etat organized by left-wing officers uh, in the army and left-wing uh, air force uh, leaders inside the air force, and they took charge of the country. And effectively, what they promised uh, was social democracy which we've been hearing about, uh, they didn't promise a large-scale revolution. They just said there would be fundamental changes and Afghanistan would be modernized, there would be democracy uh, in the country, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but it got out of control. The left-wing party was divided into two factions. And as often happens uh, with factional disputes inside a party, they start fighting each other instead of the common enemy. It's a sort of habit of the left, uh, whatever its politics in different parts of the world. And they did this in Afghanistan. And when the faction fight led to the death of the president, Taraki, the Russians moved in to try and stabilize the situation. I was very disturbed by this and thought it wouldn't go well. Afghanistan was not a hugely advanced country. The bulk of the people lived in the countryside. The structures were tribal uh, and people were very religious. You know, whether you like it or not, that was a fact. And these groups had started to fight against the progressive military regime uh, in Kabul and Kandahar, but they were looking for something to use as an excuse, as a weapon, as a scapegoat to win over more support. And the Soviet troops and the entry of the Soviet Union became that. Uh, it unified a large chunk of the population, the slow and the religious group said, we've been occupied by atheists. It wasn't so much common. We've been occupied by atheists. They're going to destroy everything. And the United States was helped in this propaganda. And uh, a civil war began in which the United States played a huge part in arming Pakistan and the military dictatorship in that country to try and defeat the Russians. And um, President Carter's uh, leading advisor on foreign policy, uh, Zee Brzezinski, actually said he did a big bear trap for Russians to come in and they walked straight in. And we had been helping these people to trap the Russians, and they fell, they fell into our trap. And when the French journalist interviewing Brzezinski said, hey, but the result of this has been a huge increase of jihadi terrorism, Brzezinski replied very contemptuously. He said, oh, what are a few jumped up Muslims compared to the defeat we've inflicted on the Soviet Union? And uh, I did write in the book uh, that this is a question which should be asked to New Yorkers who suffered from the backlash of what they did, the jumped up Muslims who then hit uh, Twin Towers and the Pentagon. Um, you know, uh, so that is uh, what happened. And then after yeah. the hits of 9-11, 
the U.S. decided to intervene again, this time to defeat the people who they'd put into power because they had not expected Al-Qaeda, which they'd funded and armed, whose leaders they'd supported, to hit them. So they then invaded Afghanistan as a crude war of revenge. It's what I wrote at the time, and now Joe Biden has admitted it. It was nothing more than revenge. And the question arises, Anna, that if it was nothing more than revenge, why the hell did you spend 20 years there? killing right. people, destroying and harming the ecology, spending trillions, the costs of air conditioning alone for the troops who were stationed there during the summer months uh, was huge. And nothing was done to improve the conditions of the people of Afghanistan, either men or women or the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I worked out once with Afghan friends that it would have cost $5,000, that is all, to build a solid mud house made with mud bricks to house a family of four or five people, if, and even more. They could have done it. They didn't want to do it. Because if you don't have social democracy at home, you're fighting against it. You don't want state money spent on creating better conditions for your own people. Why the hell should you do it in Afghanistan? And so the situation became a disaster. Absolutely. I mean, you, you talk about the uh, invasion in 2002 is retaliation for what happened um, on 9-11. And uh, the individuals who really suffered the brunt of that retaliation were the civilians of Afghanistan. And, um, you know, I'd like you to kind of get into the uh, death tolls, because, you know, when you compare, uh, we, we oftentimes in the United States hear about the number of um, U.S. military casualties, uh, but they certainly, as, as tragic as their deaths are, um, it's really the numbers are nothing compared to <clears throat> civilian deaths of Afghans. That has been true with U.S. interventions from Vietnam onwards. I mean, if you look at the uh, casualty figures in Vietnam, it was, what, I think 50,000 U.S. troops dead and 2 million Vietnamese. The Vietnamese counted their own dead, so we know. Similarly, in Iraq, at least a million and a half people killed. American casualties compared to this are virtually nothing. And the same in Afghanistan. Um, the U.S. casualties and NATO casualties are relatively low because of new forms of warfare, uh, the emergence of drones, bombing from the air. But the number of Afghans who died, their bodies weren't counted. The rough figures that we get from medical experts and others who worked in Afghanistan are that at least 100,000 Afghans, if not more, died uh, during the NATO occupation of that country. They included women, children, old men, uh, and of course the people who began to uh, oppose the, uh, the occupation and fight back. So my own feeling is it's probably un an underestimate that you probably had closer to 200,000 people dead and double that number injured, wounded. And if you add to that, that this is a country which is known malnutrition. And at the same time, as food was being flown in from the Gulf states uh, <clears throat> and elsewhere, uh, the Afghans had no food at all. The malnutrition became worse over the last 20 years. Uh, the only thing which registered a huge rise, Anna, and I think we should give credit where it's due, uh, is the, uh, the U.S. basically turning a blind eye to the production of the poppy, opium and heroin, uh, which the Taliban had managed to control, but which under the 20-year occupation grew to 90% of the world trade. And many in Afghanistan have become addicts. 
and many soldiers in the United States and Britain and the other NATO countries also became addicts. These are stories covered up. They haven't been properly investigated or done. But the price has been huge, mainly for the people of Afghanistan, but also for those who were sent there to fight for a nothing war, a war which now they all admit was not meant to achieve anything. I mean, when you look at so many different aspects of the war, you see how unbelievably counterproductive it was. Um, you know, you mentioned the uh, production of opium, and uh, that's, you know, certainly something that is not covered in um, any type of foreign policy reporting or international news reporting here in the United States. But you also um, weigh in on the impact that this war has had on women. And um, how sex work, for instance, uh, kind of exploded in, in Afghanistan um, since the U.S. invasion in 2002. I want you to get into that in just a moment. But I also want to play this video because I thought that this was really mind blowing. I mean, we're talking about a, a war that has been a failed war. This is following the release of the Afghan papers, which we'll get into a little later as well. Uh, George W. Bush does this interview uh, with Deutsche Welle and just completely refuses to take any responsibility for um, his own failures and just the fact that the Afghanistan, Afghanistan war had been a failure. And so uh, just to give you all a little more context, uh, he's being asked about Angela Merkel's uh, critical statements about the Afghanistan war. And here's how he responds to it. I was very pleased. Uh, she was supportive of troops in Afghanistan. Um, by the way, and, and one of the reasons why uh, is because she saw the, uh, the progress that could be made for young girls and women in Afghanistan. It's unbelievable how that society changed from the brutality of the Taliban. And now all of a sudden, you know, sadly, uh, I'm afraid Afghan women and girls are going to suffer unspeakable harm. Is it a mistake? The withdrawal. I, you know, I think it is. Yeah, I think because I think the consequences are going to be unbelievably bad. Tariq, uh, he makes it appear as though U.S. military presence in Afghanistan has actually made um, the lives of women in Afghanistan much better. But what is the reality? I mean, it's staggering. I've not seen that interview before. You'd have thought that since he retired from the White House, he would have had some time for reflection on Afghanistan, Iraq, and all these other wars he got the country involved in. Well, but he's been a little tied up with his uh, new painting hobby, so maybe it's, you know, a little busy with that. <laughs> but, I mean, what can you paint if you're that dumb, Anna? Right. I mean, the, the level of stupidity, I mean, I'd like to see his paintings to see see what, what, what the you know what they reflect. But anyway, it's complete nonsense what he's saying. What is true is that some NGOs in Kabul, Kandahar, Herat, and a few other cities spent money given by NATO states uh, to educate a handful of young uh, uh, girls, and that's good. Who can attack that? But the overall figures are damning. The people who the United States and the NATO countries were allied with, the Northern Alliance, had a position on women which was in practice even worse than the Taliban. I mean, the Taliban's positions I never supported and still don't. Uh, but they were very strong in punishing rape. I mean, in the sense that people were executed if they're caught raping boys or girls. Uh, the Northern Alliance used women uh, in the most disgusting way and in the countryside where the majority of the population lives, nothing changed. The c condition of women wasn't altered. That's one point to make. The second point, I think, which Western politicians know full well, but cover up, is that the condition of women in South Asia as a whole is not that brilliant. Qualitatively speaking, it's not better than the condition of women in Afghanistan. The horror stories you get from Pakistan, the number of rapes that take place every single week in India, the assaults on Tamil women in Sri Lanka, uh, 
Uh, the situation in Bangladesh used to be much, much better, but even there, some women are under attack. So let us not say that this is something special. There is a huge problem in uh, South Asia. No one ever talks about the other countries because they used this to try and justify the invasion of uh, Afghanistan. And if you're so concerned, about Afghanistan, why not open the doors? Why not say to all the women or whoever who wants to leave, our doors are open. Instead, the refugees are being stopped from coming in. Britain is now offering money to the Albanians to take some in, refugees on their way here. There's a big fight going on between Poland uh, and Belarus. Uh, as to where the refugees should go. The European Union says, we don't want any refugees, asking NATO to intervene militarily to stop refugees from coming in. This is the situation. So George Bush's hypoc hypocrisy, I mean, it's unbelievable that the guy is still living somewhere else. He has no idea of what is really going on. Exactly. Um you know, let's talk a little bit about the aftermath of the U.S. military withdrawal, because there seemed to be some shock and surprise that the Afghan army <laughs> folded immediately. And, um, you know, it was alleg allegedly built. Uh, I think built is a strong word, but over two decades. Um, and so uh, explain why the uh, Afghan army was um, willing to fold so quickly. You know, in your book, you you touch on the fact that uh, from the very beginning, uh, there were uh, Taliban um, spies who had infiltrated uh, the Afghan army. There were already issues with it from the very beginning. Exactly. And this is what the West doesn't realize. It's not just Western politicians in this case, but even ordinary people who just look at the propaganda on CNN or the BBC, which is non-stop pro-government, pro their own governments. And they cannot understand that there are people in this world who simply don't like being occupied. It's as simple as that. You go and occupy a country and you expect these people to love you. Why? What have you done that they should even look at you uh, with, uh, with, with affection? True, you buy a lot of them over. You give them money. And those who receive the money, even some of those hate you because they want to know why the hell you're there and what you're doing in that uh, uh, country. So from the beginning, uh, as I've argued in my book with you know, quotes and facts, there was not much support for this occupation, except by a handful of people, those who decided to collaborate with the United States. Um, and um, the result was that when the US and NATO uh, said, join the army, we're building a new police force, we're constructing a new army, the instructions the Taliban gave to their supporters, either hardcore supporters or just supporters in general, who backed them because they saw they were the only people resisting, uh, was you're going to be trained to use the latest military equipment, go and join. Learn uh, what they're offering you and then we'll see what happens in four or five years time. And a lot of people who join these the, the army and other institutions, the police too, were Taliban supporters, A. Eh? And secondly, even those who weren't, when they saw what had been happening in the country, they were all, you know, it had an impact on all of them, uh, said we're not going to die to defend the American empire. We're not going to die to defend NATO. Why should we? Enough of us have been killed as it is. And so we had this amazing sight of the minute the United States announced that they were withdrawing, um, the Taliban worked out a guerrilla strategy to take the country, starting from the north and moving south. Very, very intelligent. And city after city fell. No one fought back. The 300,000 strong puppet army that had been built over 20 years just collapsed. Much of it disappeared into thin air. 
Some of them joined the Taliban and the others just said, we don't like the Taliban, but we're not going to fight against them. Why should we? Then don't underestimate the impact of the resistance on many people in Afghanistan who are not political, who say, well, whatever the Taliban is, they're the only people who defended us. They're the only people who resisted. And this raises a question which liberals find it difficult to answer, that if liberals and the left in Afghanistan, which effectively supported the occupation, had created resistance organizations, if some of the women trained in Kabul and Kandahar and given monies by the NGOs had actually set up groups like the Kurdish women did uh, uh, in, in Syria, uh, and fought back, they would have people would have respected them much more, but they didn't. The entire fight back was left to the Taliban. So how could they not win? And within seven days, they rolled back a twenty-year-old occupation, and then the United States and the European press got very angry, saying that well, they'd agreed to work in a transitional government, and the Taliban replied, "Yeah, we had, but where is your government? It's fled." Mm -hmm. Ashraf Ghani, who was being praised in the entire Western media, packed his money boxes, you know, millions and millions of dollars into jeeps, flew to the airport, got hold of a helicopter which was waiting for him, packed it with his money and fled the country to a neighbor and from there uh, to the Arab world. That's where he is. So the Taliban said, who could we talk to? The president you'd put in place disappeared. The army you had built collapsed. So why attack us? Just ask yourself this question. How come this happened? So there was no one we could have a transitional government with. You know, this question's a little out of left field, but I'm curious if you were following it by any chance. Um, you know, the press in the United States, I believe it was the New York Times at the time, had published this article uh, during the Trump administration regarding the Russians paying uh, the Taliban bounties for U.S. soldiers. That story was later retracted. Um, and it was, I mean, it just seemed like complete and utter nonsense. Um, did you follow that story by any chance? And if you <clears throat> did, uh, what were your thoughts on it? As I uh, did follow it, and I was shocked, because just on the face of it, it appeared to be a blatant lie. Right. Uh, in fact, what did happen, which wasn't reported uh, uh, too often, Anna, was that a lot of Russians set up helicopter companies because they had pilots. Uh, who were very experienced in their own disaster story in Afghanistan. And now that they were privatized, uh, no longer controlled by the state, they actually went and fought with the Americans as mercenaries. That's what happened. So far from the Russians celebrating the death of a soldier, private Russians were trying to help the United States and earn a lot of money, which I'm told they did. Yeah, you're right. That is not something that has been reported on um, extensively here in the United States. And that's certainly a shame, which is why, you know, the, the books that you publish, the work that you do is so important. I want to get to the um, Afghan papers, uh, which were released in 2019. And uh, I mean, the revelations in um, the 2000 pages uh, of documents really made it abundantly clear that the uh, United States military really didn't even know what its objective was as this no. war continued. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the papers were, you know, devastating for those who didn't know what was going on. For some of us, they were a confirmation of what myself and some other journalists had been writing from the very beginning. They had no idea how long they were going to stay for. They had no idea what the objectives were. And Tony Blair's wife, Cherie, and George Bush's wife, Laura, saying that this was a war for women's liberation, I mean, it's just sickening, actually, to use women who have real problems in that part of the world and saying, we're coming to rescue you. Well, if that was the case, the war has been a failure 20 times over. Um, 
But the papers also revealed the army angry with the politicians, generals knowing that they could not win this war in the sense of taking, they, 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 what more could they do? They've got the country, they'd occupied it, they were killing people, their own people were being killed, and the politicians were just uh, watching without a clue as to what needed to be done. And it's actually, it, it was in 2019, I think, that Donald Trump first said that there should be a complete withdrawal from Afghanistan. I mean, if you look back at what happened, when Obama came to power, he had himself in his past, before he became president, not supported the war on Iraq, and he then s divided these wars. Iraq was an unfortunate episode, not that he pulled out completely from there, the, uh, and, you know, in fact, launched wars in Syria and Libya. But um, Afghanistan was meant to be the good war, and the Afghanistan papers just asked the question, what war? How can it be a good war when we don't know what our aims are, what we're going to do, the amount of money we're spending? And it's a disaster on every level, military, political, economic, psychological. That is what the war was. And it was nice for us uh, who had been opposing the war to just read similar things being said by top, the top military brass in the United States. They were not that dumb. They could see. Right. Yeah. In, in fact, I mean, when um, Trump would vocalize the need to pull out of Afghanistan, there was considerable backlash toward him uh, from U.S. politicians, including some Democrats uh, who, I mean, I think wanted to criticize Trump regardless of what he did or said. Uh, yeah. But I agreed with his decision to pull troops out of Afghanistan. Yeah. And uh, Biden really had no choice. I mean, that that deal was made prior to Biden getting elected and, and, and holding yeah. office. Um, so I, I wanted to also just kind of talk about the media spin um, that, you know, we witnessed uh, as troops were being withdrawn from Afghanistan. For instance, when uh, there were there was a suicide bombing, I, they say that it, it was an ISIS, uh, ISIS militant who uh, did a suicide bombing outside uh, the Kabul airport. Uh, there was this narrative regarding the Taliban potentially being um, in on that, that they were uh, conspiring with al-Qaeda. And I, I'd love to hear what, what your thoughts are on that, um, I because I mean, that's just a massive contradiction. Yeah. Look, Anna, the Taliban had just won. They'd got the country without wasting too much time and without expending too much blood of their of the blood of their people or them or, the, or their own armies so why on earth should they carry out or be part of a provocation i mean i think the truth will come out and has largely come out of who these guys were who did it they called themselves isis but what else should we be knowing about them? That was the only real act of violence during this whole period. And the United States then went and bombed innocents again. I mean, there yes. you had in that week a provocation by people within Afghanistan, a U.S. drone attack which killed women and children. You know, it's summing up what had been happening really in many ways for for 20 years uh, and the media in Europe especially but also the liberal press in the United States couldn't believe that this was happening my god are we leaving Afghanistan in Britain there's a sort of wretched magazine called the New Statesman which once upon a time used to be a radical magazine you know like the nation that's what it was like this devoted pages of pages and pages by writers who backed the war in Afghanistan uh, saying, why did they withdraw? Of course we could have held on. Well, the, uh, the, the response is, if you could have held on as Britain alone, why didn't you? The fact is none of these NATO countries could have held on without the support of the United States. And then they attacked the United States for withdrawing 
What did they want it to do? Maintain some garrisons, however small, and keep them on. But why? That no one said. So um, it uh, and in order to, you know, justify their attacks on the United States, all the states in the European Union and Britain. I mean, as we know, the news is effectively managed in most of these countries to some degree or the other. In Britain now, it's very strong government management of the news <clears throat> that they just unleash these big attacks. Oh, what a tragedy. What's going to happen? They had not been covering the war regularly for a long, long time. And some of these newspapers had just changed with the changes in editors and all that. The Guardian in particular in Britain, its website in the States might have some good stuff and sometimes does. But the actual paper has really degenerated. I mean, when I think that most of my pieces, short pieces in the book, were written initially for The Guardian and published in The Guardian, but that stopped happening since 2016, 2015, the big, big shift rightwards. So, um, and they, now they've got nothing to say. You know, they mm. try and attack the country instead of waging a campaign, don't have sanctions, send in aid. Uh, the, 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 the balance sheet of sanctioning Iraq is horrible. And there's malnutrition in Afghanistan. They need help. They need aid. And open the doors for the refugees. But why aren't the liberals campaigning for that? You can attack Biden for withdrawing, but then why not campaign for something positive? Exactly. Exactly. Um, why don't we uh, ask something positive, uh, something that can actually help the audience uh, stay informed on these types of matters. You know, you mentioned some of the publications that in the past may have done a decent job in, in reporting on these issues, but have unfortunately devolved under new editors. Uh, where do you personally like to go to get uh, news about either foreign policy or international events? Well, I have to admit, well, uh, on two levels, the two newspapers I read regularly uh, one is the New York Times, since it's the so-called paper of record in the United States. And at least they cover the news from different parts of the world. Whether you agree with them or not is a different thing, but it's quite useful reading them, uh, even to disagree. Uh, the other is the Financial Times, which, mm -hmm. you know, as its name suggests, is a paper of capital and then feels obliged to give slightly better reporting. But even the FT has been going down. But leaving those aside, basically, I, I go to the web, I go to the internet, I find blogs, people send me stuff they've written, um, I read Jacobin, I read Counterpunch, I read many, many other things from different parts of the world, Manifesto, in uh, Italy, uh, media part in France, which are independent papers. Media part in France is the best newspaper in Europe, in my opinion. It's not printed. It's simply online, but it's a proper newspaper, which has attacked these wars, exposed their politicians, brought politicians down, uh, etc. So, um, that's all. That's what you have to do. There's no place where you just, uh, you know, do what you used to in the past and depend on two papers or three at the most. It's impossible to do that because you would learn nothing. If you enjoyed this video from Jacobin Weekends, please hit like and subscribe. That way, you'll enjoy all of our backlog as well as all of our future content, including interviews, live streams, and clips. Thank you.